Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. My name's Jason and thanks for watching. Now, if you guys are in the market for a power station, you're probably pretty confused about all the options to choose from and what you should look for. Well, the purpose of this video is to make that a little bit easier. I wanna show you guys seven key features that you should be looking for when you're purchasing a new power station. Hopefully you guys are excited. Let's just jump right into it. Okay guys, number one is the charging speed of the power station. This is probably the most important thing because if you're gonna have to use this, you can't wait around for it to charge for 10 hours. You need to charge it up in four to five hours. And if you can get it to charge in three hours, that's even better. So how that works is you need to have a 20 to 25% charge rate on the portable power station you're looking at. And let me explain how that works. If you have a power station that has 500 watt hours of storage, that means it should charge at at least 125 watts to get it up to full capacity in about four to five hours. Now, if you have a portable power station that has 1500 watt hours of storage, that means it needs to charge at 375 watts to get up to full charge in four to five hours. Now, a lot of power stations fall a little bit short of this, but there's some that do really well. The EB55 is a great power station that charges really fast. This OOP 600 actually has dual charging. It charges at 160 watts. So that's great for this power station. And some of the other units charge pretty quick, but they're just not quite up to that standard. This would be perfect if power stations would always charge up to 100% capacity in four to five hours because that allows you to get it fully charged in one solar cycle. Okay guys, feature number two is pass-through charging. Now all the power stations here on my desk do support pass-through charging. In fact, I will not recommend a power station without it. Now what pass-through charging is, is you can have a solar panel plugged in or the AC charger plugged in and you can still use the power station output. So say you have you know, a phone charging or you're running a 12 volt compressor fridge, it can charge and run the fridge at the same time. Now this is an essential feature. I will not recommend a power station that does not have it. So just make sure that when you're purchasing a portable power station in the future, that it has pass-through charging. Okay guys, feature number three is make sure your power station has a pure sine wave inverter. Now, there's two different sine waves that you can get on inverters. There's a modified sine wave and there's a pure sine wave. Now the modified has kind of square edges on it and it's not perfectly round. A pure sine wave is the type of power wavelength you get out of your wall outlet in your house when you have electricity and you can run any type of appliance including sensitive electronics off that. Now the problem would be if you purchase a power station that does not have a pure sine wave, you can actually damage sensitive electronics and have a lot of noise on that so it does not work very well. Well, I always recommend that your power station has a pure sine wave inverter, and I do check that on every single power station I test and review to make sure that that's actually correct. Okay guys, we're flying through these. Number four is a DC output that's regulated. Now, you usually won't see this issue on you know more expensive brands. You'll find this on the smaller power stations that are kind of an off-brand, and what that usually is is they'll have a lithium ion battery It'll have total voltage of 12.6 when it's full. And then when it's down, you know, completely empty, it's under 11 volts. And so that is really bad. You won't be able to run 12 volt compressor fridges. You won't be able to run sensitive 12 volt appliances like CPAPs because the voltage is too low. So you wanna look for a power station that has a regulated DC output or has the direct lithium iron phosphate voltage output as well. And uh, a lot of them are actually regulated right around 13.3 volts, which is a great level of regulation. Okay guys, the fifth feature you'd wanna look for in a power station is the actual display. An amazing display would show your input and output wattages. It would give you an actual percentage on the capacity remaining on the battery, and it would actually give you an estimated time that it'll be full or when it's completely empty at the current load you're at. Now, all these power stations have different displays. For example, the Bybean has a great display it's small, but it gives you all the information you need to know. The OOP 600 also has a great display that shows you everything you need to know, but there's a few power stations that are a little bit short. The EB55 and EB70 both have a display that lacks a little bit of information, it doesn't give you an actual percentage of the battery, and it doesn't tell you the estimated runtime at the current load. So just make sure that when you purchase a power station, you're aware of what the display shows. Now it's not a deal breaker, but I would like to have you know, any power station company that's gonna make these have a good display in the future. There's no reason to have a display that doesn't have all the information about the battery. Okay guys, feature number six is to make sure the power station can actually run for a full night without auto shutting off. 
Now, a lot of these power stations will actually sense if they have a voltage being taken out. And then if there's actually something running on the unit, it won't turn it off. Now, I recently did a review on the V2MAN Jump 1500. That power station automatically shuts off at six hours, no matter what's going on. If you were running something important, it would just shut off right at six hours. Now I've tested all of these power stations and these do run without any issues. I've run a 12 volt compressor fridge on, overnight on each of them and they don't shut off. So just make sure that your power station doesn't have some sort of automatic shut off mode where if you're gonna be running a 12 volt compressor fridge or you're running a CPAP, it's not gonna shut off in the middle of the night on you. I'll make sure to test that on my reviews. So if you check out any of my power station reviews, you should know if it's going to run overnight. Okay guys, the final feature that you'd want on a power station is a USB-C power delivery port. Now there's different levels of power delivery and there's also ports that accept output only or input and output. Let's go ahead and briefly describe how that works on these power stations. So the Bybean and the Ctechi both have a 60 watt power delivery output. They don't accept charging input on those ports. Now the Oops 600 has a 60 watt power delivery port, but it supports input and output. And what's really cool about this is it accepts dual charging. So you can have a solar panel and the USB-C input port, uh, both active. So you can get 160 watts charging on this. So that's 100 watts via solar, 60 watts via USB-C. Now the EB70 and the EB55 both have 100 watt power delivery ports, but they only support output power. They won't accept input power. Now the GoLabs R500 and the Energizer 320 have a 100 watt USB-C power delivery port that accepts output and input. So that means I can take the EB55 with the USB-C cable, plug it into the Energizer 320, charge it at 100 watts, or I can take the EB55 using that 100 watt output and plug it into my GoLabs R500 and charge it at 100 watts. So that's just an overview of how USB-C works. I'd really like to see 100 watt power input and output ports on all the power stations moving forward. So just make sure that that's an option on a power station that you're looking at. Okay guys, well those are the seven main features that I thought were important to have on power stations. Obviously there's other options like LED lights or wireless charging. Both the EB55 and EB70 have wireless charging pads on top for cell phones. If you think that I forgot an important feature, go ahead and throw a comment down below on what power station feature you'd like to see on a future power station. Now, if you guys want to learn more about any of these power stations, I have a complete detailed review on each one, and I should have a review video coming out soon for the GoLabs R500 and for the Energizer 320. Now, the last thing I'd like to talk about is just the differences between different chemistries in power stations. Now, there's two main chemistries on power stations today. You have lithium iron phosphate batteries, which all of these on the table have lithium iron phosphate batteries. And then you have lithium ion batteries, which are NMC, which are a little bit lighter weight and they don't get quite as many life cycles. Now, each of them have their benefits. I'm planning to have a video out in the future comparing those two together to see what the pros and cons of each one are, but both options are very good and they just have slight differences. Now, if you guys like this video and the content, go ahead and smash that thumbs up button. It helps me know if my viewers like what's going on in my videos. Also, if you like power stations, 12 volt compressor fridges, solar panels, DIY electric projects, if you like that stuff, you're probably going to like my channel. So I invite you guys to subscribe and stay tuned for future content. Anyway, guys, thanks for watching. We're going to go ahead and end the video here. I'll see you guys in the next video.